Welcome to the Car Gurus UK YouTube channel and we have got an interesting one today. It's the all new Kia Sportage and without giving it all away at the start, it is pretty flipping good. We're going to get into exactly why that is, but first here is your reminder to subscribe to the Car Gurus UK YouTube channel so you don't miss when our new videos go live. Welcome then to the fifth generation of Kia Sportage. It's a very important model this, with the Sportage being Kia's best-selling car in the UK, Europe and worldwide. As such, Kia has really thrown the kitchen sink at this car to help it stand out in what is a very crowded part of the market. So if you think of some of its rivals, you've got the new Nissan Qashqai, that looks very bold and striking on the road. You've got the Peugeot 3008, still looks great, even having been on sale for a while. And you've got the Hyundai Tucson, which is this car's sister car, which again has those cool headlights at the front that really help it stand out on the road. Now, Kia has gone with these boomerang LED daytime running lights. A different take on things for the Hyundai, but again, they really help it stand out. It does have Kia's Tiger nose, but it's a much slimmer interpretation of it here, the grill here. And then of course you've got the bigger grill underneath. If we come around to the side, so this car is slightly longer, slightly wider, and slightly taller than the previous generation of Sportage. That just gives the designers a bit more car to work with. So some of the details that I like here, you've got this chrome strip running all along the bottom of the windows and then it picks it up again here and, and swoops around the back of the car. Looks really neat. Um, for wheels, this is a GT Line S, so it's a top spec model. It's on 19 inch alloys. A bit dirty today, sorry about that. Uh, if you go for a lower spec model, they're on 18s and then the base spec is on 17s. I haven't seen one on 17s yet, but on 18s and 19s, I think the Sportage certainly has loads of presence on the road. Get this too, the Sportage you see here is the European spec model and although slightly bigger than its predecessors, is smaller than versions of the Sportage you'll find in other markets. That includes having a slightly shorter wheelbase, which Kia says is to help the car feel more at home on European roads. And that just goes to show the importance of the European market to Sportage sales, doesn't it? Now, going back to the design, my favorite bit is around the back here. Look at these rear lights and the way they curve around. Clearly, this is very much inspired by the EV6 electric car, but I think it translates very well to an SUV body. And just to think as well, this is a brand that not all that long ago was known for building budget cars. And yet here we are with a Kia looking like this and a great big Kia badge slapped across the back. Certainly nothing to be embarrassed about. The bold styling hasn't compromised practicality. Total boot volume varies depending what model you choose, but with the figures ranging from a worst of 526 litres to a best of 591 litres, the Sportage is up there with the best in this class. The rear seats meanwhile fold in a 40-20-40 split and there's an adjustable height boot floor as well as some useful underfloor storage. Now, if you want an SUV where you can slide the rear seats forwards and backwards, the Sportage is not for you because it does not have that functionality. You can adjust the backrest, it's actually a bit too far back at the moment. You can adjust it as so. Uh, but space-wise, I'm five foot 11, uh, driver's seat is set for me. It's actually a little bit further back than it normally be because it electrically slides back a bit when you get out. And I've got loads of room, loads of leg room. Um, we've got the uh, panoramic sunroof in this high spec model. It does eat into headroom a bit, but as you can see, five foot 11, I'm still perfectly comfortable here. Um, other neat touches, you've got some little uh, USB-C chargers in the back of the seats here, so devices can stay topped up. Coat hooks here. The middle seat is wide enough that you could fit three adults across if you wanted to. There's a small hump in the floor, but it's not bad. Um, what you don't get though are three separate sets of Isofix. It's just on the outer seats. Uh, speaking of the outer seats, they're also heated on higher spec models. So it's all looking pretty rosy for the Sportage so far. And then just wait and see what's next. <laughs> So what we have here is possibly one of the most compelling reasons that I think people might choose a Sportage over one of its direct rivals. Because this interior is, well, it's a bit of a showstopper. And that is because of this long panel here with these two 12.3 inch screens. Now, I think it's fair to say that Kia's progress over the last decade or so means that we expect its cars to have good interiors. And the EV6 has shown that it can have 
really, really good interiors. But the Sportage is quite a lot cheaper than an EV6, and yet here it is, still looking like a tech showcase. Now, it's worth pointing out that the two most basic versions of the Sportage don't get this same setup, instead receiving a smaller screen for the dials that is joined either by a smaller infotainment system in two spec models or this 12.3 inch systems in the GT line. Move up to mid-spec three trim or above though, and both of these screens are yours. And not only do they look great, but they work very well too. These dials, for example, have a very crisp and clear display and you can change what's on the middle of the display by using the controls here or change the whole style of the dials by switching through driving modes through eco normal or sport the main infotainment system has a lot of features to delve into and some of the graphics are a bit small particularly those related to the active safety systems which seems ironic but it is all intuitive to use and the inclusion of apple carplay and android auto is welcome there's also a touch of theatre in this panel down here below the infotainment system, which you press once to have all your heater controls, and then you press again to give you shortcut buttons for the infotainment system. Uh, it's a tiny bit fiddly perhaps, but I think overall it's just about at the acceptable end uh, of where function meets form. Uh, elsewhere, nice big buttons for like the heated seats or heated steering wheel control, so that's good. Plenty of storage, there's a lidded compartment here with all your charging sockets in. Uh, there's more storage under the armrest, the cup holders swivel around here, that's quite neat. Quality wise, it is very good, it's still not quite BMW or Audi levels of fit and finish in here, and I think a Peugeot 3008 also has a slightly more tactile, more feel-good factor in its interior. However, this tech-first approach I can see offering a lot of appeal to buyers in this class. Kia certainly hasn't held back when it comes to drivetrains in this new Sportage. So there's plain petrol or diesel models, there's petrol or diesel models with mild hybrid technology, there's a petrol full hybrid system or self-charging hybrid, and there is a petrol plug-in hybrid model as well. So unless you want a fully electric car, chances are there is going to be a Sportage to suit your needs. Within those choices, buyers will find manual or automatic gearboxes, as well as front wheel drive or all wheel drive. Both petrol and diesel engines are turbocharged and both are 1.6 litres in capacity. I pinched this car from the UK launch of the Sportage where I was able to drive a few different configurations of the car right from the 1.6 turbo petrol with a manual gearbox all the way through to the full hybrid model with an automatic. Now all the models were good to drive. I would say that with the manual the clutch action was a bit vague which made it easy to stall. Um, the full self-charging hybrid model uh, is noticeably more powerful and it can run on electric power alone up to speeds of around 30 miles an hour over short distances if you're very gentle with the throttle. Now, what was interesting is that I drove the same route, it was about 60 miles in both of those cars covering town, motorway and country roads and both of them returned between 42 and 44 miles per gallon so don't buy the hybrid necessarily because you're expecting it to return much better fuel economy unless you're doing lots of urban driving. Today though we are driving neither of those models, instead it's the same 1.6 turbo petrol engine but this time paired with a 48 volt mild hybrid system, a 7 speed dual clutch automatic gearbox and all wheel drive. It's probably not the Sportage that I'd recommend because I'm not sure that the all wheel drive system is going to benefit that many drivers and also it means the fuel economy suffers so you're more likely to see between 35 and 40 miles per gallon with the all-wheel drive plus if you get a gt line or a gt line s like this the bigger 19 inch wheels just add a bit more of a fidgety edge to the low speed ride than you get with the 18s so with all that in mind i think our recommendation would be a three spec car with the 1.6 turbo petrol engine mild hybrid automatic gearbox and front wheel drive um, that way you get the slightly better fuel economy, you get the 18 inch wheels for that slightly smoother low speed ride and you still get these two big screens on the dash here plus plenty of other kit as well. Not only that but at £32,600 it's a good £6,000 cheaper than the car I'm driving here. Now I haven't driven the diesel Sportage yet but as far as the petrol engine and the hybrid go uh, performance is pretty decent. Um, so there's good low and mid-range torque and while the engine does sound a bit strained at high revs, if I knock it down and put it in sport mode, see if you can hear, yeah it's just a bit strained but 
you know, the performance is there. So this is the 1.6 uh, mild hybrid petrol. Uh, it has 148 horsepower and 0 to 62 in 9.4 seconds. So for a family SUV, that's perfectly respectable. And the ride, as I mentioned before, at low speeds, it can be a little bit fidgety, particularly on the bigger wheels, but once you're up to speed, it smooths out brilliantly. In fact, this is a very good long distance car because it also has really well controlled levels of wind and road noise. So it's quiet and generally comfortable, but that's not all. It's a satisfying SUV to drive in a way that the Sportage has never really managed before. So the steering, for example, has a, a nice meaty weight to it that makes the car easy to place on the road. And when you turn the wheel, the car responds without any real slack. Now, a, say a Tekka or a Ford Cougar do feel a bit more agile and are ultimately gonna be a bit more rewarding to drive on a twisty road. However, the Sportage certainly doesn't disgrace itself in that regard. It doesn't wallow or lean excessively in corners. It just feels very controlled and very composed. Put it this way, you're probably not going to buy a Sportage simply because of the way it drives, because as good as it is, it lacks the dynamic sparkle of the best in class. However, if you're buying this car for any other reason, whether it's the styling or the technology or the reassurance of Kia's seven year warranty, then there's nothing in the way it drives that is going to feel like a letdown. Plus, if you're buying it having run a previous generation of Sportage, which logic suggests many people will, you're going to find a car that has been usefully improved in pretty much every area. Now, whether that makes it the best car in the family SUV class, I think we'd probably need its leading competitors in the same place in order to find out. However, what I can say is that this new Sportage is definitely in the running. Would you take a Sportage as your mid-size SUV or does one of its rivals offer more appeal? Let us know in the comments and remember that when it comes to finding your next car, you can find loads of great deals from top rated dealers by visiting cargurus.co.uk.